So we've made it nearly done with this unit. We started with viruses, talked about bacteria, protists, fungi, and now finally kingdom plantae, which really started with the colonization of land plants. Now, land plants and kingdom plantae are not the same thing. Although we will mostly focus on land plants, there are some aquatic plants. Now, a lot of things that look like plants in water are algae, but there are actual plants that live in the water as well. But scientists believe that was colonization of land plants happened first, and then some of them almost went back to the water. It's almost like the evolution of, say, whales and porpoises, that they are, their common ancestor was a land mammal that then re returned, so to speak, to the sea. So we're going to focus on just colonization of land plants, but do know, you know, later on there were some plants that um, kind of readapted back to aquatic life. Now, up until this point, not much was happening on land. So although, yes, we were getting more oxygen, yes, we were getting more ozone, the land was pretty uninhabitable. Uh, we didn't have cyanobacteria. We didn't have protists. Keep in mind, a lot of those organisms have to be in water. These organisms don't have the capability of, like, literally don't have the capability of being on land because a major problem with land is drying out. And so land was pretty barren um, hundreds of millions of years ago when we started seeing the colonization of land plants. And so that's what we're going to kind of explore first is like, how, how did we make that jump? But before we talk about that, we will talk about it in this video. Let's just talk about, you know, just plants in general, um, kind of their use. Yes, they're important for the ecosystem, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but in reality, it's really important to understand um, plants and their connection with humans. So first and foremost, I mean, probably their most important function is they make food, right? Whether or not you eat it directly or we, you know, create food to use for our pigs and then we eat bacon, um, however it is, they are the root of every single food system in the world. And so incredibly important in that sense. And they also produce a fair amount of oxygen, not all the oxygen, but a fair amount of that oxygen. Thinking about our soil, so not only do they build and help literally create soil, but they also hold soil in place. The picture that you see here is from the Dust Bowl um, during the Great Depression, so 30s, 40s, even into the 50s. And we as farmers were still kind of learning sustainable practices. When we harvested our crops, we just left the uh, soil barren. We didn't plant anything else because there was no other foods that we were growing um, in those off months. Well, you pair that with drought and what you have is now very loose, dry soil. There's nothing holding it in place. And out in the Great Plains where it is quite windy, the wind was literally washing or moving that soil around and away. And it actually made farming in that area completely die. Even if there was water, there was no soil to plant your, your plants in. And so we have learned now as a society, like, hey, plants are incredibly important for holding the soil in place. Not only thinking about farmers, but even thinking about, you know, steep slopes, thinking about our mountain regions, thinking about, you know, building things, especially near um, slopes of things. We know the power of plants in holding that soil together. We also take advantage of a lot of timber products. So thinking about paper, toilet paper, paper towels, napkins, your desk. I uh, think about your home might have wooden, probably has wooden studs in it. Your goods around the world are shipped on wooden pallets. So we take advantage of paper products. Uh, so a physical product. And then finally, I say finally, there's tons of ways humans use plants. Another one is thinking about medicines. So this bullet point is looking specifically at uh, cancer drugs. So about 60% of cancer drugs are actually derived from plants, which is pretty freaking cool. But plants also help in other medicines. So thinking about ginger, uh, ginger is really great uh, for nausea and just um, stomach health. Looking at aloe, really great for burns. Did you know that aspirin is actually a derivative from uh, that was originally discovered in the willow tree, weeping willow? It was der derived from the willow bark. Lots of examples in our plant kingdom of medicines that humans have been able to, I guess, take advantage of. 
So we're really fortunate in that sense that we have plants and have a wide variety of plants. Not only are they impacting, you know, our diet, but our health and where we live and how we live. They pretty much control our life um, to, to a major degree. So now that we've kind of talked about the importance that we, we rely on our plants, let's talk about kind of that evolution to land. So as I mentioned before, land at this time doesn't really have a lot going for it. <laughs> like literally, there is not much there. It is a, it's a wild west, so to speak. And one of the major challenges is water. Yes, precipitation exists, but up until this point, our bacteria, our protists, um, our earliest fungi are found in water. And water is a great material for a lot of things. One, all organisms need water for cellular respiration. Really easy to get water when you live in water. <laughs> the other thing that is needed, cells in general need to be in aqueous solutions. So even if their exterior isn't in an aqueous solution, the interior has to be. In order for to maintain your interior as aqueous, you need to be getting water. And also reproduction. We'll talk about reproduction more on the next slide, though. So imagine your kelp, brown kelp in the water. The entirety of your body is in the water, which means all of your cells can get their own water. But the land plant, that's not the case, right? It is not constantly raining. And so plants, in order for plants to make it to land, a couple structures needed to evolve. And this is what the product was of those structures, vascular tissue. Now, there's, there's probably lots of different solutions to this problem, but this is the solution that ended up evolving. You're probably familiar with the term vascular tissue when thinking about humans. We talk about the cardiovascular system. Vascular tissue just means essentially a series of tubes delivering stuff. In humans, our cardiovascular system is delivering blood, but in essence, what it's really delivering is that oxygen to our cells. Well, plants need vascular tissue as well, but their vascular tissue is moving water around. Their roots, for the most part, always have some sort of access to water. How much water really depends, but always have access to water. And so what the roots really need to be doing is getting that water, but then sending it to the rest of the plant because the rest of the plant isn't in water. Kelp, always in water. Land plants, rarely in water. And so they needed to evolve some sort of way to get water to other parts of their, uh, uh, of that organism. And what ended up evolving was this vascular tissue. As we explore different plant phyla, we're going to talk more uh, specifics about that vascular tissue. The other problem with land, and again, really this lack of water that is on land, is getting your reproductive material out. When we were talking about the fungal, fungi kingdom, we talked about how they reproduce using spores. Spores go out into the world, they land, they, they grow into hyphae, etc. But plants don't, uh, or... or Plants have a couple things. Plants have egg and sperm. The protists that they were derived from had egg and sperm. Actually, a lot of protists use egg and sperm. You are familiar with egg and sperm. Animals use egg and sperm. So egg and sperm is pretty much the major uh, genetic material found like across multiple kingdoms. It's not just in the animal kingdom. So plants and the protists that they were derived from were using egg and sperm. Well, beautiful. When you live in the water, not a big deal, right? You release sperm, sperm swims. Cool. You're a land plant. <laughs> like your sperm's got to swim, but what is it swimming in? Because you're no longer in water. And so plants, for plants to be successful, there had to be some sort of evolution that allowed them to be able to still reproduce, despite the fact that they're not in that benefit of always being in water. And that's exactly what happened. The, this, this system evolved called the alternation of generations. And essentially what the alternation of generations is referring to is essentially teetering between a haploid stage and a diploid stage. And I say teetering, so think about humans. We are diploid organ. Everything about us is diploid. The only thing that is haploid is our egg and sperm. 
But in plants, it's not that way. There's some stages that are diploid and some stages that are haploid. It'd like be saying, hey, when you're a baby, you're actually haploid. And as you get to be an adult, you're diploid. Kind of like that. So plants are kind of unique in having these two different generations, which again are referred to as the alternation of generations. Now this picture has a general, a general life cycle of what all plants go through. Now what I'm going to do is I am going to draw this as well. It's actually going to use all the same exact words you see here, but I want you to be able to essentially be able to think this up in your head itself. So this is already drawn, but I want you to think of drawing it yourself. So what I'm going to do is pull out the drawing board. And in this drawing board, again, all I'm going to draw is the alternation of generations. And I'm going to highlight the, the key words in this alternation of generations. And hopefully it's going to be kind of easy, like, oh, yeah, like this totally makes sense. That's my, that's my hope, at least. So what I'm going to do is I'm first going to write down all of, oh, come on, there we go, all of our keywords. So the keywords we have is sporo fight. I'm going to pause. So fight. Remember when talking about algae, that fight means plant-like. So we got sporophyte, we have spores, we have gametophyte, we have gametes, um, and then not an actual structure, but we're also going to put meiosis on here. So these are the key terms in the plant life cycle. You're going to see these terms a lot. But it's important to just understand the general life cycle. And so what I'm going to do is draw the general life cycle, very similar to what was on that slide, but I want you guys to think about it. So let's start with the word that you probably know. You probably know gametes. This would be egg and sperm. And if you know anything about egg and sperm, and hopefully you do, you should know that gametes are haploid. Cool. So this is the one that you probably knew. This is why I'm starting it. Now, the next step is one that you probably wouldn't know. But once I give you this next step, then you probably can figure out the rest of the cycle. So we know that egg and sperm in general come together, right? They come together, they create a zygote, they start growing into something. So that's exactly what's going to happen. So our next step is egg and sperm come together and they're going to grow into a structure called the sporophyte. Now, phyte means plant-like. This is literally a, like, thing. Like this is a plant. This is something you see. So it's growing into a plant structure. Because this was egg and sperm, two haploid things coming together, that's going to make our sporophyte diploid. Now think about the name sporophyte. A sporophyte. What do you think sporophytes make? Hopefully you're like, wow, I think they make spores. Oh my god, you'd be totally correct. So sporophytes make spores. It will be easy to be like, ah, this is like fungi. And part of it is, but I honestly think it's, it's really important to kind of keep those separated. Um, so we do see spores and fungi. They're actually very similar in plants. Similar to fungi, spores are haploid, which means something happened right? Something happened in our sporophyte because our sporophyte was diploid and now it's making haploid spores. So that must mean that meiosis happened here. So that's where we're tying in our meiosis. Cool. So you have gametes, they come together, they create a diploid sporophyte. That sporophyte undergoes meiosis to create spores. We only have one word left. And so the spores, they land somewhere, they start growing, and they're going to start growing into the gametophyte. Similar to fungi, again, I'm kind of hesitant about trying to make connections to fungi, but similar to fungi, spores just grow. They're not coming together. They're not fusing together. They, they're just growing. The spores land and they just start growing. So this gametophyte is haploid. This is, it's just growing. And like the name gametophyte suggests 
that is, is a plant-like thing creating gametes. So that's my last arrow. So again, this is exactly what was on the slide, but I wanted you to be able to reason out what's haploid and what's diploid and kind of where these terms are. We're going to be doing four plant life cycles, but all four of them follow this same general pattern, uh, which is really nice. It really makes it a lot easier in learning them. So I'm going to go ahead and flip back to the slides. Um, there's not really much left on the slides, but again, wanted to show you that the, the image that is on this slide is identical to what we just did. Now we started with gametes. Gametes are over here. But again, the reason I started with gametes is because of those four different parts of the life cycle, that's probably the part that you're most familiar with. Um, so yeah, that, that's why I started it there. But it is the same cycle, whether you're looking at this one or the one that we just drew. So that's pretty much it for our introduction uh, from plants. You've learned that they're really important to our ecosystems and really important to human livelihood. And hopefully you've kind of recognized the challenges that plant evolution had to undergo in order to be able to survive on this barren, dry landscape. And what we're going to explore in the rest of these videos is the four major groupings of plants and how they approached uh, reproduction differently and kind of their impacts on their environment.